Hey everyone, Dr. Armagani here today to talk to you about one of my favorite procedures, the T-LIF, also known as the transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion. This is a procedure performed through your back to help take pressure off of your nerves and to help realign your bones. If you have severe compression of your nerves in your lower back, you may be experiencing symptoms of discomfort, particularly in your buttocks and hamstrings, but it can even go all the way down to your calves and feet. In this video, we will be discussing the normal anatomy of your lower back, as well as step-by-step -step how I perform this procedure. At the end of this video, I'll discuss risks, expected recovery, as well as any post-operative restrictions. If you want to skip around to different sections of this video, please see the timestamps in the description below to find the parts you want to learn about the most. Now that we have an overview of the video, let's get started. Okay, now that we're in, let's discuss one of my favorite procedures, which is called the transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion, also known as the T-LIF. Before I get into a discussion of how I perform this procedure step by step, let's take a look at what the normal lumbar spine anatomy looks like from the side. Here is a normal lumbar spine. As you can see here on the right side, this is going to be where the skin of your back is, and then you're going to have the front of your body over here. Your nerve root is highlighted here, and then the space by which the nerve root exits the spinal canal and then goes down your leg is called the foramen, highlighted here in red. The vertebral bodies are highlighted here. These are the building blocks which stack on top of each other to create your spinal column. In between each vertebral body is going to be a disc. The disc is going to be the cushion-like material between the vertebrae, which gives you flexibility and motion. This, however, is a degenerative spine. You can see that this looks significantly different from the last view that we had. But let's point out some of the things that we noticed before. The nerve root is highlighted here. But a degenerative spine has several different features which caused it to look this way. That involves disc height loss. So that tall disc that was in between the vertebral bodies is now significantly smaller. That causes bone spurs to form. When you have bone spurs form, that can encroach upon the space where the nerve is trying to exit the spinal canal and go down your leg. And that leads to a smaller foramen highlighted here in red. This smaller foramen is what causes the nerve to be pinched, which can cause increased discomfort going down your leg. To continue to highlight this further, this is a normal lumbar spine and you can see how tall the foramen is. This is again the degenerative spine with a significantly smaller foramen. The goal of surgery though is to create increased space between the vertebral bodies while also removing any of the bone spurs that are causing encroachment or compression of the nerve as it's exiting the spinal canal. This is what it looks like after we're all done. So what you can see here is that there's a nice cage in between the vertebrae. And then what we do is we place a little bit of this material here, which is called bone graft, to help induce the fusion, which is the connection between the two vertebrae. After the removal of all that bone, you can see how much bigger the foramen is or the space for that nerve. There's absolutely nothing touching that nerve anymore. Where is the incision for this procedure? I tend to perform this procedure a couple different ways. If I'm doing this procedure open, this is going to be about a two to three inch incision in the middle of the back. If I'm choosing to perform this procedure minimally invasively, which is not for everybody, you'll have two one inch incisions on either side of your lower back. Now that we have an understanding of the goals of surgery, let's take a look at some of the pertinent anatomy that we have to go through to be able to do this procedure correctly. Here is going to be a back view of the normal lumbar spine. Let's take a look at some of these important anatomic landmarks. These over here on the left are two separate vertebrae. Up top here, you're going to have what we call, let's say the L4 vertebrae. And this is going to be the L5 just for orientation. The spinous process is highlighted here in red. The spinous process is the bone that you can feel when you're touching your lower back. Coming down on either side of the spinous process is going to be the lamina. The lamina is going to be the protective bony covering over the spinal canal. The very outside edge of the lamina is going to be what we call the pars, highlighted here in green. Now these next two anatomic landmarks are very important, but they're a little bit confusing to think about. This is because they connect the bones together. So you cannot have bones that can move around side by side or have any sort of flexibility without these two bones. This bone is going to be the inferior articulating process, or IAP, and that is going to be this bone in orange. So this bone in orange is going to be the very lowest point of the L4 bone, and it connects to the superior articulating process, which is here in purple. The superior articulating process belongs to L5. 
So these two bones together combine and they form what we call a facet joint. Just like any joint in your body, you have a hip joint, a knee joint, those are the convergence of two bones together which allow motion. So the convergence of L4 and L5 is through this IAP and the SAP. Lastly, the transverse process is highlighted here in pink. These are important because you have one at each vertebral body level. And it's important though because that's where we help get our fusion. Now that we have a good idea of what the surface anatomy looks like, let's remove these bones and see what's underneath. And this is what we see. The pedicle is a very important structure. This is the connection from the back of the bones, which goes by the spinal canal into the vertebral body below. This is going to be the corridor by which we place our screws. The disc, which is the cushion between the vertebrae, is highlighted here in blue. This is what we remove to place our cage and bone graft through. The vertebral body is highlighted here in green. These are the building blocks which stack on top of each other with a disc in between. And lastly, you have the fecal sac, which is the long balloon that extends from the base of your skull all the way down into your lower back, which then contains your nerve rootlets. Coming out of the fecal sac, beneath each pedicle is going to be a nerve root highlighted here in purple. And you can see that every nerve root begins right underneath the pedicle. So the fecal sac can take a bunch of nerve rootlets put them together and package them into a nerve root which exits right below the pedicle highlighted here. Now that we have a detailed understanding of the anatomy, let's go step by step how I perform this procedure. Remember, the goal of the procedure is to try to get a cage in between the two vertebral bodies into that disc area. So if you remember our anatomy, our disc is going to be underneath these two bones here. What are these two bones? This is the inferior articulating process of L4 and then the superior articulating process of L5. The names of it don't really matter. You just have to know that we have to remove this bone in this area to get to our disc. And let's see how we do that. The first step is that we're going to remove the bottom part of the lamina highlighted here in black. So we'll take our high speed burr and we'll go gently in this area and remove right along the black line. And here we have it. Now, once that area is removed, we're able to see a very small bit of that disc. But as a bonus, there's no more compression of this nerve root because of any bone spurs. So now we know that this nerve root is completely decompressed. With this nerve root now completely decompressed, what do we have to do? We still have to remove enough bone so that we can see the disc space properly. And how do we do that? Well, this piece of bone right here is what needs to be removed. And that's what we'll try to do. So that piece of bone is highlighted here in black. And so we'll take our drill again and we'll drill right across that superior articulating process to expose our disc fully. And now you can see that there is plenty of space for us to see this disc. And this is going to be the area in which we insert our cage. But there's still just a little bit more work to be done. Because we've completely decompressed this nerve root by the removal of this top part of bone, we still need to remove a little bit of this bottom part of bone here so that we can completely decompress the nerve root as it's going across. We'll do this with an instrument called the kerosene. With this kerosene, we'll go ahead and we'll nibble off this top part of bone here, removing it completely. When it's removed completely, the very beginning of the nerve root is going to be completely decompressed, and you can see that highlighted here in red. The beginning of the nerve root is right here as it's going right by the pedicle, which I'm highlighting here with my laser pointer. Remember the location of the pedicle when we have to put in our screws later. We now have a situation when both of the nerve roots above and below are completely decompressed and we have excellent access to our disc space, which we have highlighted here in red. But we still just need a little bit more space. We get that space by inserting a small retractor to move the fecal sac over to the side so that we can see more of that disc. And here is that retractor coming in. So we'll retract that fecal sac a little bit more towards the midline, and that helps expose much more of that disc. This is highlighted here in red, where you can see we have a much bigger area for us to access the disc. This access allows us to get a bigger cage in. With the disc completely exposed, now we have to make a cut within the disc to start removing that disc material. So we'll take a knife, and we'll make a small hole within that disc space. That's highlighted here in black. It is through this hole where we'll remove the rest of the disc material completely and then be able to place our cage to increase the space between those vertebrae. Before we go any further, we're going to transition to another view here, so I want you to understand the anatomy. 
This is the top view or the cross-section view. So to orient you, the top of your back or the skin of your back is going to be up here up top and the front of your body is going to be down here below. Let's take a look at where these same anatomic landmarks are in this cross-section view. The spinous process is highlighted here in red. This is the bone you can feel when you're touching your lower back. Coming from either side of the spinous process down is going to be the lamina. Following the lamina, we go into the facet joint, which is the connection between the vertebrae, which allow you to move around. The transverse process is highlighted here in pink and comes off of the facet joints, and this is the area where we get a fusion. One of the most important anatomic landmarks that I keep discussing is going to be the pedicle, highlighted here in green. The pedicle is so important because it acts as a corridor from any area in the back through into the areas in the front. So it's through this corridor where we're able to put things like a screw. The disc is highlighted here in blue. Lastly, the thecal sac is highlighted here in orange. Another important point about the pedicles is that the thecal sac is not going to extend out past the borders of the pedicles because that is the most lateral extent or most outside extent of where the spinal canal is. Now let's jump back into our procedure, but this time in the top view or the cross section view. What we have here is we have our bone removal already complete. And you can see now that we have a corridor that can go into the disc space. This is the area where we need to get our cage and bone graft. Unfortunately though, the thecal sac is actually in our way of getting to the disc. So we have to find a way around it. And the way that we'll find our way around it is to try to retract that thecal sac out of the way. So we'll go ahead and bring on retractor in and we'll move the thecal sac out of the way. Now we have a corridor by which we can safely enter the disc space and start removing the disc to eventually place our cage. So what we'll do is we'll start taking our disc away by using this instrument called the pituitary. So we'll take a little bit of that disc and then we'll use a series of other curettes and other instruments to completely remove the disc below with the thecal sac completely protected with our retractor. So we'll bring in our curette here and we'll slowly start removing all of that disc material until the disc is completely gone. With your thecal sac completely protected and all of the disc material completely pulled out of the disc space, we then put different sizers in to find out the size cage that can best fit your body. Once we find that, we place a cage which is coming in here in black and we slowly start to tap that cage into space here. So we'll go ahead to tap it in now. And then what we'll do is we'll place a new inserter on top of the cage to turn it. So it's going to turn in the front like this so it sits right in the very front of the disc space. After this, we'll then place some bone graft and this is your own bone that's recycled. And we'll place that bone graft directly behind the cage and this is what acts as the area for fusion. So as time goes on, your body will send cells through the disc space, through your own bone, and that will eventually heal like a broken bone would. After the course of about a year, all the bone that we are putting within your disc space will be completely solid, and that is when the fusion is complete. We then remove the retractor, and then the thecal sac goes exactly where it was previously. So we're able to get the cage and the bone right into that very small area because we're able to retract the thecal sac over. Let's take a look again at this from the back view. At this point now, the retractor has been removed and this black hole is the area where the cage and the bone graft has been placed. Now what's left is for us to complete the decompression. So around this black line is when we're going to take our high-speed burr and go around and around to remove the remaining parts of the bone to decompress the nerves on the other side of your body. After that bone removal is complete, we'll take that bone and we'll place it between the transverse processes highlighted here in red. So we'll take this bone and we'll place it right on those transverse processes and over the course of about a year, that too will heal and create new bone and that will help fuse these two bones together. The last step is for us to find places where we can place our screws. Remember that special anatomic landmark that I talked about before, the pedicle? The pedicles are going to be underneath the lamina right here, highlighted in red. Now, it's hard for you to see but we as surgeons are able to know exactly where these pedicles are to place our screws. Here's an x-ray view for you to have a better idea. You can see now the exact location of these pedicles. They're again highlighted in red. 
Now that we have an idea of where our screws could go, we one by one slowly place these screws in, and once they're completely placed within bone, this is what they'll look like from the back view. Again, these screws are going through the pedicle, alongside the spinal canal, not within the spinal canal, and going into the vertebral body. This gives us great fixation points for us to hold the bones together. But how do we hold the bones together? We have to put a titanium rod in between the screws, and this is what connects the screws. Finally, we attach the rods to the screws with these little locking caps. At this point now, these screws and rods, you can think of it as acting like an internal cast that holds everything together. And the reason why it needs to hold everything together is it needs to hold it still so your body can go through the healing process of making this immature bone over here on the left side and also within your disc space, mature bone. How long does that take again? Well, if you remember, over the course of about a year, you'll find that that immature bone has now become solid bone, which is now connecting both vertebrae. This is when our fusion is complete. Here's a look at the before view, just to give you an idea of all the work that we have to do. And now the after, with the solid bone in its place. You can see that you have the spine and nerves completely decompressed. You have a corridor by which you place your cage and bone graft into the disc space. You have the screws and rods holding everything together. And finally, after one year, all that immature bone that was your own bone has now become solid bone again, just like it would if you, if you fractured your wrist and then it eventually healed back together. Now let's look at the before and after from the side view. Remember how degenerative the spine used to look? Well, this is how it looks after. You see the space between the vertebrae has been significantly increased by the placement of this cage, and now we have the bone graft behind it, which will eventually heal to become solid bone that will complete the fusion between these two vertebrae outlined here. You have all the space in the world for the nerve, and finally you have the rods and screws going into the vertebrae connected by this rod. And I know that was a lot of steps, but that's step-by-step -step how we perform the T-lift or the transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion. Let's go over some risks of this procedure. The first one is infection. The risk of infection is very low, somewhere between 1 and 2%. Some patients are at a little bit higher risk of infection. Those patients are obese, poorly controlled diabetics, smokers, or those who have undergone prior procedures. If you are one of those patients, we do have a conversation with you about this slightly increased risk. Dural tear or spinal fluid leak is another risk I worry about. Remember, you have a thecal sac or balloon that begins at the base of your skull and goes all the way down to your lower back. It holds spinal fluid to give nourishment to your nerve rootlets. Sometimes during the course of a surgery, you may get a hole within the thecal sac. If that occurs, that needs to be repaired either with a stitch or a patch. If that does occur, we probably have to keep you in the hospital another day or two to make sure it's not continuing to leak. Very rarely, though, that leak can persist even after it is repaired, and you may need to come back to the operating room for us to fix it again. Another risk that can occur is that the bone may not heal fully. Remember how we took your own bone and recycled it and placed it within your disc space or off to the side on your transverse processes? That process of taking that immature bone or crunched up bone and making it your own bone, connecting the two vertebrae, takes about a year to make. Some patients may not heal this, although the vast majority do. Those patients at increased risk are smokers or those who have soft bone to begin with. If this occurs, you may need an additional procedure. We try to follow this closely over the first year by getting x-rays of you whenever you come back for a follow-up visit. Nerve injury is another risk that I worry about from time to time, although this is rare as well. In the process of moving your thecal sac out of the way or impacting that cage in between your bones, you may get a slight nerve injury because of something hitting the nerve or because of prolonged retraction. If that occurs, you may have some difficulty lifting up your feet or you may have some pain in a persistent area for a period of time. This does get better with time, however. Lastly, we worry about persistent pain. This can come from permanent nerve damage because of how long the nerves were compressed prior to surgery. As a spine surgeon, all we can really do is take pressure off nerves and help realign the bones. We can't fix a permanently damaged nerve. Once the pressure is removed from your nerves, your body is then able to go through the healing process to fix what it can 
Some patients may not get 100% relief, but most patients get the vast majority of their symptoms resolved with this procedure. Any remaining pain, numbness, tingling, or weakness that persists after about a year may be due to permanent nerve damage because of how long the nerves were compressed prior to surgery. What's the recovery like following this procedure? Generally, patients will stay one to two nights in the hospital and then go home. This is just to monitor drain output if you have one and to help control your pain postoperatively. Occasionally, some patients can even be done outpatient, but that is in special circumstances if we are doing this minimally invasively, which is not for everyone. Because of the incision and the retraction that's required to get the hardware in, you are going to have back pain for a period of time. That steadily improves after the first month though. Remember though, this surgery is not necessarily to help exclusively back pain. We're doing the surgery to take pressure off your nerves and to make your legs better. Any improvement that you may have in your back pain preoperatively is an added bonus. There are a lot of causes for back pain that surgery cannot fix. You could have arthritis at different levels or muscle weakness, which can also cause lower back pain. Lastly, what I like to tell my patients is that this is a marathon, not a sprint. It takes about one year for your nerves to heal to their full extent. Remember how I said previously that you may have some aspect of permanent nerve damage because of how long your nerves have been compressed? Well, it takes your body about one year to heal a nerve about as much as it can. So how you feel at one year is going to be how you feel long term. So no snap judgments. At any point during that year, you may have some ups and you may have some downs. How you feel at one year, though, will be how you feel long term. The first six weeks, you do see a lot of ups and downs because your nerves are starting to readjust to getting full signals from your brain. You're going to have some really good days and some really bad days within that first six-week period. You just got to let the dust settle at that point. What can I do post-op? When you go home from the hospital, I like you to keep the bandage that you leave the hospital with on for three days. After three days, you can remove that bandage and underneath you'll find butterfly strips holding your incision together. Inside the incision are going to be internal stitches which are also holding your skin together. After three days, you may get into the shower and shower normally. Let soap and water run down your back and pat it dry afterwards. No baths, you don't want to be soaking the wound. After you get out of the shower, pat it dry and place a new bandage over the top for the first week or two because you don't want it to rub in your pant line. After about a week or so, those butterfly strips should fall off on their own. If they're not off within a week, you can pull them off. Please let us know if you have any problems like drainage after about a week. Take a picture of it and send it to our office so we can have an idea if you're having a possible infection, which is rare. From a restriction standpoint, we don't want you to be bending, twisting, or lifting greater than 20 pounds for about three months. If you have a heavy labor job, we want to know that beforehand so that we can write you off to have you on light duty. If you work more of a desk job or desk work, you can go back to work whenever you feel comfortable as long as you're not bending, twisting, or lifting more than 20 pounds. This does allow you to do things around the house though, like grab a bag of groceries or a gallon of milk from the fridge. It also allows you to go down into your cupboard or if something falls, you can pick it up or put your shoes and socks on. All that is fine. Another thing we like patients to do is to be able to walk as much as they can. The reason why I encourage patients to walk as much as they can is because it helps remake the connections from the brain down into the legs that may have been disrupted because of how much compression has been going on. From a pain management standpoint, we like to encourage over-the-counter medication use to help decrease the amount of prescription pain medication that you may need. One rule is you're not allowed to take any anti-inflammatories for a period of six months. The reason why we don't allow you to take anti-inflammatories is that it, because it can decrease fusion rate. Examples of anti-inflammatories include ibuprofen, Motrin, Aleve, Advil, Naproxen, Mobic, or Celebrex. What you can take, though, is two extra-strength Tylenol three times a day. So that would be 1,000 milligrams of Tylenol with breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And if you need to, you can take the prescription pain medication and muscle relaxer on an as-needed basis. Generally, for my patients, they're not taking it more than two to three times a day, and they are completely off of the prescription pain medication, usually by four to six weeks. And that's an overview of many of the frequently asked questions that I get following this procedure. And there you have it, the transforaminal lumbar interbody fusion, also known as the T-LIF. Hopefully after this video, you have a better understanding of the normal anatomy of the lower back, as well as step-by-step -step how I perform this procedure 
and what to expect postoperatively. If you're curious about conditions that can be treated with this particular procedure, please see the links in the description below. To have a consultation with me regarding your spine, you can call our office phone number also found below, or you can click book an appointment above if you're on our website, www.armaganispine.com. If you'd like, you can also follow me on these other platforms here. And if you're on YouTube, please comment, hit like, and subscribe to be notified about other future educational videos such as these. Take care.